Welcome to Social Music Talk, a show that explores the past, present, and future of music. I'm your host, Alex Cosper, along with my producer, Sam Kadura. Hey, Alex. How Thanks you doing? Thanks for, uh, yeah, I'm doing great. Today we're going to be talking about Tom Petty, and with us on the line from Los Angeles is John Scott. Hi, John. Hey, Alex. How you doing, man? Great. You're the author of Tom Petty and Me. That is it, a new book about my 40-year working relationship with Tom from 1977. And um, it's, uh, pe- people seem to be loving the book. I've got nothing but positive reviews, and that really excites me. It really does. Yeah, didn't you recently do an interview on Sirius, and that, that caused a surge of orders? Whoa, did it ever. <laughs> it did. It definitely did. <laughs> um, and Mark Felsot of... Um, of Sirius did a great job. He's a really talented guy. Um, and I do listen to Tom Petty Radio quite a bit. All right. Well, let's talk about Tom, and let's talk about your book, and, and let's talk about you. But I also want to talk about the, the record industry, how it's structured so that people, that some of our listeners know nothing about the music industry, so they need to understand that a, a label is this big thing that the artist is signed to, and then there's a distributor who's even bigger than that. Sometimes I guess, mm-hmm. and so let's let's uh, talk about that uh, with the understanding that the audience, not all the audience, might under might, they might not understand the structure of the music biz, but um, but it'll become clear as we have our conversation. Starting with your history, now you were on the radio before you joined uh, MCA Records in the seventies. And uh, tell us about that background, how you went from being on the radio at FM 100 in Memphis, uh, which was a legendary rock station at the time in the 60s. Uh, Tell us how you went from that to working in the music biz. Well, um, we had uh, a great station, FM 100 in Memphis, and we were allowed to play anything that we wanted to play. And um, the other great thing about the station was that we had 400,000 watts of power and wow <laughs> when we were first hired we, the the station was grandfathered in i think in 1947 to okay. get an additional 300,000 watts cuz all you can have now is 100,000 yeah and um we really didn't the jocks who were hired really didn't understand what 400,000 watts meant until we started getting calls from Georgia and Alabama <laughs> and Arkansas yeah. and we're going how are you hearing us and they're going you're coming in loud and clear but um, uh, so, yeah, so I, I think the fact that we were able to play what we wanted to play um, uh, caused a lot of record promotion people to come to Memphis because we were breaking bands. And when I say breaking bands, <laughs> we strived to play something new that was good as fast as we could before anybody else. That was our goal. And our goal was to play a record and then get a phone call from the record store going, who are you playing? Because people are calling. Were you considered and, a free-form station? Yeah, we, I think the beginning we were kind of a rebel top 40 station, and then we switched to a progressive-type format, which let most everybody play what they wanted to play. Right. And um, we uh, we played ZZ Top way on early on, David Bowie way on Early on, as a matter of fact, I did a, an hour interview with David Bowie. Uh, I think it was the first or second interview he'd ever done in America in 1972, right before Ziggy Stardust came out. And a part of it exists on YouTube, um, David Bowie, 1972. But there's an hour tape out there somewhere. We're trying to find it. Hmm. But, but anyway, yeah, so, so promotion guys started coming by. And, you know, they were they were really cool guys. You know, nine out of ten of them were just great guys. And um, I kind of thought, well, these guys are making more money than I am. <laughs> you know, on radio, like Tom's new song said, I would have done it for free. You kind of know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, they were making more money than we were, and they had an expense account. And to me, when I started thinking about it, a guy started saying, hey, would you be interested coming to work for a record company, and I thought, well, you know, it's kind of the same thing as being a DJ. I turn my my listeners on to new music, and as a promotion man, you turn on radio stations to new music. So in my mind, I kind of, kind of thought it was the same thing, so when I was offered a job by MCA Records 
in 1974, something like that, 75, mm-hmm. um, as a local promotion man, I took it, and um, I hated leaving radio. I really did. <clears throat> Excuse me, but um, but being a promotion man all of a sudden was just the greatest thing in the world. So you moved to L.A., right? Well, no, I moved from Memphis to Atlanta in about three months. Okay. I had been doing really good, and they had an opening down there, and they moved me to Atlanta to do regional promotion. And that's where I came in contact with Leonard Skinner and from the very beginning, and hung with them, which is kind of a crazy, wild story in itself. Um, but then from Atlanta, I got moved to Los Angeles as head of album promotion shortly thereafter. <clears throat> and um, I mean, I'm a kid from Memphis, Tennessee. I, don't, I think I've been to Los Angeles one time before. <laughs> and uh, it's a frightening experience. Um, <laughs> it's a lot bigger. <laughs> you know, you, when you start to land, you see these... Miles and miles and miles of you know homes and land and yeah. golf courses and but uh, right. the great thing is I got to work at Universal City where they had all the studio the the movie studios and TV studios lots and you would go to lunch you'd see Doris Day or Rock Hudson or whoever was shooting on the lot that day so I was like a kid in a candy store you know and I was promoting bands uh, I remember you know the DJ I played. The Who, and they were one of my favorite bands. Right. And the next thing I know, I'm, I'm in MCA Records in Los Angeles, and then The Who were on that label. And my one of my jobs was to go out with bands for two weeks to make sure that all the DJs came to the sh- to the shows. But I found myself sitting next to Pete Townsend, and I'm going, "This is like <laughs> unreal." Right. You know, here I am, a kid from Memphis, sitting next to one of my idols, Pete Townsend. Right. In, but, uh, in radio, did you get to interview rock stars? Like, did bands come by the station? Oh, yeah. We had plenty, plenty of bands. Um, I think the first interview I did was with the Birds. Wow. And um, and I think they all, oh, four or five came, all came up to the station, and they they had patchouli oil on. And I didn't know what patchouli oil was, <laughs> but it kind of smelled kind of funny. And a matter of fact, my... After they left, my general manager came in and said, well, this guy's smoking pot. And I said, no, no, it's patchouli oil. Patchouli oil. But no, we interviewed, boy, you God, we had Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top, uh, David Bowie, as I mentioned. Um, yeah. Just lots and lots of people would come by because they knew that we were selling records. Yeah, because your station then was pretty much kind of like one of the hubs of the, like, southeast, right? Yeah, we were pretty much one of the first stations to switch from... Um, easy listening music to rock. So you're a powerhouse station that actually made a lot of bands happen, like like that broke a lot of bands. Oh, right? absolutely. Okay. And, uh, yeah, you can uh, you can look it up. Uh, <laughs> we were really that was one of our main goals back then is to to break a record, to break a band, to start someone's career off. And but we we only played you know music that we loved. We would never play a song that we didn't like. Right. Right. Because our audience would just know it right away. Right. That was a crap song. And right. So that that was our kind of our goal back then, and it was just so much fun uh, because you got to know your listeners. They call you every night on the request line, and <laughs> they became your family. Right. So by the time you got to L.A. and you're like sitting with uh, Pete Townsend at shows and stuff, or, or being there right there. Uh, um, at, with MCA Records, uh, tell us about that story with John Cougar Mellencamp. How you <laughs> actually were involved with his early records? Yeah, well, I'd been there a couple of years. I was doing good. Like I said, I was. I gave Leonard Skinner to go a record for one of their first albums, and um, uh, hanging. Like I said, hanging out with Elton John, going on a tour with him on this private plane. The Who. <laughs> and then they uh, played a record. They gave me a record by a kid named Johnny Cougar. <clears throat> and I actually liked about three or four songs on the album. And um, I think I was in a meeting, and the president of the label said, Who is this kid, Johnny Cougar? Anybody know anything about him? And I raised my hand. I said, um, I like three or four songs. And he said, Which songs do you like? And I told him one of the songs. And he put the needle down and played 30 seconds of it and kind of took it off the turntable and tossed it. <laughs> and said, who would play a song by a kid named Johnny Cougar? That's the stupidest name I've ever heard. <laughs> and um, the A&R guy, artist and repertoire guy who signed him, 
said he signed him because of a couple of demos and because he was managed by Tony DeFreeze. <clears throat> At that minute, Tony DeFreeze name popped in my ear because Tony DeFreeze managed David Bowie. And David Boyd just fired him at that point. But I, from being from radio in Memphis, I knew who Tony DeFreeze was. So I knew mm-hmm. this guy, you know, he's no dummy. He's probably onto something. And so uh, they invited me to uh, – I, I, the record company hated Johnny. They, um, <laughs> they hated his music, his name. <laughs> and uh, the A&R guy after the meeting said, hey, do you want to go see this guy? Nobody's ever seen him. And they flew me to Seymour, Indiana to see him. <clears throat> and – I really wasn't expecting anything. And I got to this little uh, National Guard armory where there's like 200 people in Seymour, Indiana. And like I said, I wasn't expecting anything. And he came away, and, or he came out and just blew me away. And I called Los Angeles going, hey, this kid's a superstar. And they're going, you know, what are you smoking? <laughs> Seriously, dude, we'll, we'll talk when you get back home on Monday. <clears throat> and so... I came back and told him the story about this kid, and they were kind of like skeptical, like I might have been just way too high or something. <laughs> and uh, but I just kept working Johnny Cougar. I, 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 mean, I, I made it kind of a mission to go after his career because I, I, I believed in him. Right. But well, just one quick question, because we have a show that comes on right after this called the the Wide World of Weed. <laughs> it's all about cannabis, and this show is starting to tie in with it. <laughs> I'm just curious, uh, like, was it kind of mandatory for people in the music biz to smoke weed back in the 70s? Oh, yeah, sure. That was kind of, <laughs> that was kind of uh, you know, you, you know when, you, when you smoke weed, you, you, it doesn't necessarily mean, you hear a song and you go, God, that's great. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's, that weed said, <laughs> pot said, hey, it, that song's great. Right, you know? right. Well, Sometimes you, it's just great. Yeah. It has it nothing to do with Cheech and... anything. Yeah, Cheech like and Chong that. is a whole different thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think it just, you know, kind of helped, helped enlighten your ears, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, so I, I hired a cougar. I did, I did crazy things. I hired a cougar and went around different radio stations in L.A. and into Tower Records. And they had a photographer, and we made all the trade magazines. And I thought I was onto something, and they fired me. They just <laughs> told me to stop working Johnny Cougar, and I wouldn't do it. <clears throat> and they fired me. Was, and it, I thought that was, was it because of the way you promoted it, like your stunts? <laughs> well, well, it made the the trade magazines, the pictures did, but not yeah. many stations were playing it. Okay. And I had just gotten one of the biggest stations in <clears throat> WMMS in Cleveland to play it, and... And that's when they cut, they fired me because I just wouldn't stop, and they told me to stop because they're going to drop him. Wow! And so it was, you know, at the time, worst thing in my life happened because I'd moved out here not too, you know, a few years from Memphis and didn't know what to do. And <clears throat> out of the blue, I get a call from a guy at ABC Records. And that wasn't out of the blue; it was about thirty months I was out of work. Or three, I mean, three months I was out of work. Mm-hmm. And he called and asked me to <clears throat> do the same position, head of album promotion for. ABC, and I I jumped on that job because I loved the guy who was my boss, Charlie Miner, had a promotion. And um, I went there on Monday, and <clears throat> they had a great office, great turntable, but uh, Charlie came in and said, you've got to swear, John, to raise your right hand, you will not pull another Johnny Cougar stunt at this record label. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And literally three days after that, I was going to lunch and hoping my closet and an album fell down. It was in a white jacket. <clears throat> and on the vinyl, it didn't have any name of any song. or And something told me just to sit down and play this record. So I sat down, I put it on, I heard Rockin' Around With You, and I heard Breakdown, and I started getting chill bumps going, oh my God, and then American Girl finished upside too. And I literally was in a trance because I said, Good God, who are these guys? And I ran to my boss and I said, who are these guys? And he put the record on. Oh, that's that punk band, Tom Petty and the whatever's, uh, the Heartbreakers. And I said, punk band, what are you talking about? He said, John, the record's been out for eight months and it hasn't done a thing. We put Breakdown out as a single. It did nothing. And the reason it did nothing, I believe, was because of the cover of the album. 
um, that hurt Tom look, looking like a, you know, a black leather jacket on and needles. Or, I mean, uh, looked a little too, around, like, yeah. too biker, too tough. Something, I mean, <laughs> and they actually they were, they were buying ads in uh, Teen Magazine and um, New Wave Magazine okay. to promote him. So, anyway, so... Um, that's uh, interesting that you say that just real quickly. I was in high school at the time when Breakdown uh, came out. You know, mm-hmm. when I heard it, it was in 78. I didn't hear it earlier than that. Mm-hmm. Um, as it, I heard it as a top 40 hit, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I thought, to me, it sounded like new wave music or punk music. But at the time, I didn't know much about punk. I just mm-hmm. lumped it in with that. W- were mm-hmm. they... Was Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers marketed as punk or new wave? Yeah, they were. Um, and yes, they were. And um, But at the same time, it caused a lot of stations not to even listen to the record to cover the album. Right, because <clears throat> it was too much of a new sound. Well, you know, people, radio stations, FM stations weren't playing punk records per se back then. Right. It was more, you know... Um, <clears throat> um, Linda Ronstadt and right. Jackson Brown and the Ramones were lucky if they got lots of airplay somewhere. Yeah, you know, it just started coming in a little bit, and um, so Tom's record had been out for one year, and nothing had happened except they would go to England. They started making noise over there, but you come back home and Tom used to tell me, you know, we go to England and people know who we are. We come back home and we're nobody. <laughs> <clears throat> But anyway, so I I, I I I begged for six weeks to just try and get the, get it played, and my boss was hesitant to do that. But I said, look, I have nothing else to do. If I can't get it played in six weeks, I'll stop. I promise. And so he said, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and try to get this uh, unbankable. He's called an unbankable punk band. So it was the, the last. It's last chance to become a hit. Otherwise, they were going to get dropped, right? Yes, they were. And who knows what would have happened after that? There's nobody that knows. But um, so I um, I just went on another mission, and I didn't know what they. I, I took it to a friend's house with a DJ starting a new station here in Los Angeles, and he asked. He he flipped out when he heard the record too. That, never that, heard of him. Was that K West? Yes, K West. Charlie Kendall. Yeah. K W S T. Yeah, K W S T. And. Um, he said, are they any good live? And I said, you know, Charlie, I don't know. I just picked up this record two days ago. And he said, it's just freaking awesome. Well, let's go. Well, where are they playing? I said, well, they're playing Saturday night at the Whiskey, opening for Blondie. And he said, let's go. I said, well, hell yeah. <clears throat> so we went. And um, they. And I, I was sitting there going, before they came out, I was going, please, God, don't let them be bad. Please let them be looking like rockers and not punk bands. Um, and they came out, and man, they were the coolest looking band you've ever seen in your life. Tom had a scarf on and a, you know, a, a flying V guitar and Vox amps, and they just slayed me. I mean, I I had heard the music, and now I saw it. I was validated everything in my mind when I heard that record in 1977, and. Um, they played a 30-minute set. There was about 10 or 15 people in the whiskey. There was no encore. And um, that's when I decided to go upstairs and introduce myself to the a guy named Tom Petty. And um, I did. and told him that um, I was the new guy at ABC, and the whole band started laughing at me. Because Tom went, hey, you're the new guy at ABC, the record label we hate. <laughs> and... Um, so I asked Tom, I said, have you ever heard your record on the radio in Los Angeles? He went, no. <clears throat> Excuse me, and why? And he said, why? I said, because you're going to hear it Monday morning on K-West, this new station. Let me ask you, before you finish this part of the story, mm-hmm. uh, was was Tom Petty already in a dispute with ABC, who had been bought out by MCA? No, not at that time. Okay, so why did, why, why did he hate the label at that time? <laughs> well, because nothing was happening in the United States. Oh, so okay. It was getting no airplay. Oh, okay. And the guy that um, my boss, Charlie Miner, was more of a top 40 guy. Okay. And I remember him telling the promotion guys, don't work Tom Petty's song, work Billy Davis and Marilyn the Coup. Mm-hmm. And so Tom just kind of got lost in the shuffle, and that's why... Right. Um, 
he was so upset with the label. Okay, I get it. Uh, now, wasn't he uh, also, we got to get back to that story, but but wasn't he on Shelter Records, the same label as Dwight Twilley Band? He was. He was definitely on Shelter Records. But, but Shelter was bought out by ABC, right? Correct. Okay, okay, okay. Correct. And, well, the, the Shelter was on MCA Records at, in the beginning. Oh, right, right, right. When they had a song called Depot Street. Okay. And I happened to be a new promotion guy, and guess what song I liked when I heard these? They, they sent you a cassette with all the new okay. releases. But they were called the... Um, Mud Crutch. Mud Crutch back then, yeah, in And 74. I looked in the re- Depot Street, and I went, I like this song, <laughs> and but it's a, kind of a dumb name. Yeah. <laughs> and I got it played on a radio station. Yeah. That's and cool. I called my boss and I said, "Hey, I got Mud Crush. My first ad is a promotion guy." And he said, "Forget Mud Crush. <laughs> it's only a single." So I forgot right. Mud Crush. I didn't, you know, I didn't think anything more about him. And then um, Tom threw me out of whiskey, which was fine. I didn't care. I knew what I was going to do. I was going to break his career. I told him that. <laughs> I told him who I was, and every time he he didn't care uh, heard the record. <laughs> On the radio, he's going to think of me, John Scott. Uh-huh. And he just kind of went, yeah, right. <laughs> and just, so we got out of there. And within a week, Tower Records had ordered 250 copies of the re- of the of the album. Yeah. And um, Wow. Yeah. And was and, it because of K-West Airplay? Yes, K-West only. Okay. Because Charlie was playing it like once breakdown, like once an hour. <laughs> so then and, uh, KLOS had to play it after that, right? They weren't playing it. No, it took a long time for KLOS and KMET to play it. Wow. <laughs> but uh, Because they all, they all thought it was a punk band. Yeah. But, but it, to me, it was like a no-brainer one listen. It was a no-brainer. It was the New Rolling Stones. It was, it was the new future of rock and roll. Yeah. Was, in my mind, Yeah, <laughs> I'd never seen anything like this band live myself. I mean, the Who were great, Nelton was great, but the... Tom Payne and Heartbreakers, man, they're a band, and they do nothing but just rock, and they will, you know, right. knock you, knock you on your socks. So then, from K West, it the airplay grew from there, right, to put t- uh, breakdown uh, high up on the charts, right? Slowly, it started. It started slowly, and I had to convince a lot, a lot of people who had heard the record six months before and just dismissed it and said, "Hey, John, the promotion guy." For ABC played us this record eight months ago, and we don't like it, and we think it's a new wave band, and we're not going to play it. So I had my work cut out for me. <clears throat> Excuse me, but um, the, kind of the breakthrough, I think, was when um, there's a station in San Francisco called K- KSAN, and they were really mm-hmm. a champion of Tom right. Betty. And wow. uh, the program director there said, I, I asked her to keep playing breakdown she said john i've played it for eight months i can't play it anymore <laughs> give me something new so we recorded a live version in front of about 50 people at capitol records and uh it, was, it actually was a whole concert but I had, I had told tom i need a kick-ass version of breakdown like you've never done before mm-hmm. and he promised me he would and he did and i sent that copy on a reel-to-reel tape to every radio station, FM station in America. And I think I said, um, forget the forget the black leather jacket and the bullets, just play the FM record. <laughs> and um, and I think that's what, what caused stations to start going, <clears throat> oh, my God, this is a good band. And so gradually it started going and going and going, and they re-released Breakdown and went to number 40 on the charts. Mm-hmm. And... Um, so it, it took it took a lot of convincing to a lot of people. I mean, there were still people, even though we, I think it was 90 stations that we didn't have on the record that were programmed by one consulting firm, and they thought it was a hype. Was that you know, we, uh, Lee, Bra- Lee Abrams? Yeah, Abrams, Abrams Burkhart. Yeah, Burkhart yeah. Abrams. Yes, Burkhardt really Abrams. <laughs> Burkhardt Abrams. And Douglas, yeah. <laughs> but and, Abrams, uh, Abrams was the music guy, right? And so he was the guy you had to convince, really, to get yeah. a record on a lot of stations, oh, yeah. a lot of rock stations, to oh, get a yeah. big rock. I mean, hit. they just couldn't. Stations were they, they were they were consultant, and you know the stations were paying them good money for their research and their information, and and they didn't like the band, they didn't like the record, <laughs> so. It took me going to Atlanta 
and he came up with Lee came up with an idea to do these uh, radio frequency tours. Like, you know, if your station was at 103 on the dial, the tickets would be a dollar and three cents. And we had to do that in about ten markets, and which is kind of you know humiliating when you're playing for a dollar three and you have practically giveaway tickets. But people came, and we got them in the doors, and all the jocks came in the doors. And, you know, when you see Tom Petty, you know immediately there's something different about this band. They're damn good. And that was kind of the breakthrough of, of um, once he added it to the 90 stations, it was like wow. we had, <laughs> this is like on the fifth week of my sixth week that I asked for. Right. So, because my, my boss would come out of come my office and go, um, John, he'd look at his watch and go, it's, um, any ads when they got petty in the beginning? And I was kind of going, oh, yeah, yeah, it's coming, it's coming, it's working. Yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway, so yeah, that, that kind of sealed the deal. We had every station in America playing so Breakdown. at what point did they realize, did they go back and listen to the first album and pick up on American Girl and other songs? Well, you know, American Girl, I may be wrong about this, but I, I, I don't think it was released as a single. Right, right. Once, Not at first, but it later became his signature song. Yeah. Well, well. So, so the plan was to, and once Breakdown made it to number forty on the charts, to release American Girl as a single, and then um, I went. Tom invited me to his house, and he played "Listen to Her Heart," mm -hmm. and um, I went back to the ABC and said, "You know, you won't believe what this guy's got. The, the demo that he's got," and um, they heard that song. And said, you know, forget American Girl. We got to put. We got to re-sign this band now, and we got to put this out next album out. Okay. So listen to her heart. Even though it was supposed to be the first single, they wouldn't. They they the record company balked at that because it had the word cocaine in there. Okay. So they went with I need to know, right? Well, no, it was. Um, it was. Uh, you think you're going to take her away with your money and your cocaine? And they wanted him to change it to champagne. Okay, and, okay. And he wouldn't do it. So we put out, um, where, what song? I, I thought, I thought, see, I thought I Need to Know was the next single. It might have been. It could have been the <clears throat> first single. Um, um, you know, that's and, then, and then Listen to Her Heart was a single, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It came, it, it, and because the, the first song had, had done so well, he just said, you know, I, I'm not putting it out any other form except the way it is. Okay. And they put it out, and every FM station in America just went crazy because top 40 stations would not play a song that had the word cocaine in it. Well, the song Cocaine by Eric Clapton, uh, that came out, what, 79? Yeah, he probably had the same problem. So that was a year later, probably. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Right, I'm sure he had the same problem. And, on... and, and the Grateful Dead song, um, Casey Jones talked about high on cocaine. And right. And that was early 70s, and... And there was one other, uh, well, Ringo Starr, No No Song, talked about cocaine. <laughs> uh, there, there, there were a few songs to mention it leading up to that. Yeah, there was, but um, no top forty station would ever touch a record like that. Okay, but um, once um, once FM station started going on playing the hell out of that song, top forty stations um, finally jumped in and. And I'm not sure how high "Listen to Her Heart" got on the charts. It was pretty high on the top forty charts, but yeah. it didn't crack. <clears throat> I think it maybe ended up at number sixty-two or something like that. But but because there were still stations that wouldn't play it. But damn the torpedoes! That silenced all critics, right? I mean, that was the big, Absolutely. big, big, big breakthrough for the band. Absolutely, that was that was when they went into got into their fight with MCA. Right, and, and that was nineteen seventy-nine. Right, FCA wanted to buy ABC Records, and um, and Tom was he he was not happy about that because he he had been on with Mudcrutch on MCA and he nothing happened. I wasn't happy about going back to a MCA because I thought they would just fire me again. <laughs> and um, and right around that time. <clears throat> um, a guy played me a record by a, a kid named Billy Thorpe, an Australian singer who had a mm -hmm. song out called "Children of the Sun," mm -hmm. and um, that was, it was. And they offered me a job to leave ABC, and I was kind of happy because 
MCA was in the process of buying ABC Records, and they wanted Tom Locke stock and barrel. He said no. Hmm. Okay. Because he had, had signed a really bad deal with Shelter, and, and MCA wanted to take advantage of that. Okay. And he just said, I'm, I'm not going. I'm not coming over there. And he filed a, I think he filed bankruptcy at that time. All right. That got which, him out of all the problems of owing the label money. Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so they went out on the road and toured for, you know, a couple of years while this lawsuit was going on. And on the side, you know, going into studios and cutting songs that they had written. <clears throat> but they were hiding them. For, they, I mean, MCA had detectives out trying to find any songs that Tom was recording. And they had to hide the tapes at night. <laughs> but um, they finally got, the, you know, got it worked out. And uh, this kid named uh, Danny Bramson... <laughs> Excuse me. Was a was a, was a uh, friend of Cameron Crowe, the Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and Jerry Maguire producer. And he was friends with a kid named Danny Bramson, who was a really a shining star at MCA. Mm -hmm. um, he worked. The, he booked bands for the amphitheater, and he became known as kind of the golden boy. And Cameron said, "You ought to start your own label." And he said, "That's what I want. That's what I wanted. Been wanting to do." So he started this label called Backstreet. Mm -hmm. And Tom and Cameron, Tom, Cameron introduced Tom to Danny and his management. And Danny said, I'll get you out of this. And I think he got him a $3 million deal. Oh, and man. and one of the things was that I had to be the promotion guy for Backstreet. Okay. So in other words, he, he by then you had established a pretty good relationship with Tom, and he credited you even by that point for saving his career. Yes, he did. He, he did. He really did. And it was on just about every album cover or in, in, you know, in, in her jacket or whatever, but uh, he would always credit me. And um, <clears throat> so, yes, break. And so I went to Backstreet Records as the head of promotion. And the funny thing about it was it was like sweet revenge because I was, I was nervous at first because I just said, well, they're just going to tell me to shut up because I you know, I'd been fired. And Tom said, hey, look, you're going to be the boss, so you tell them what you want. And so I did. I told them I wanted blue vinyl, red, red vinyl, postcards, you name it. <laughs> and um, they had nothing. They, they couldn't do anything about it. They had to do it. So it was kind of like sweet revenge for me. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and then Damn the Torpedoes was the breakthrough album. Now, how much of that success would you attribute to the producer, uh, Jimmy Iovine? Jimmy Iveen was, um, he, he was, you know, a young kid who had just done Bruce Springsteen and Patty, Patty Smith. And um, he actually, I think when, when Tom hired him, he thought he was going to be the engineer. And Jimmy came to his house and said, I am Jimmy, Jimmy Iveen, and this is my engineer, Shelly Yakov. And Tom says, no, I thought you were the engineer. And he said, no, I'm the producer. And so they, you know, they, they, they hit it off, and, and I think, Jimmy really brought the best out of Tom, but Tom had you know had been writing songs for years because they were in this dispute, and I think Jimmy really helped shape his sound to be more because, professional or more. Yeah, Jimmy stayed the producer for several albums. Yes, he did, and um, <clears throat> he's a funny guy. Jimmy's really a funny guy. New York, I think he's from Brooklyn or something, but. Mm -hmm. Really funny guy, and um, I'm not sure why they separated. I can't, I mean, I can't well, remember. The, the album that had a different producer for the first time, uh, I guess, well, Mike Campbell, the lead guitarist, became a, a co-producer with Tom Petty, uh, starting with uh, uh, Let Me Up in 1987. Yes. Okay, prior to that, Jimmy Iovine had been the producer through Southern yeah. Accents. Yes, that's, that's correct. And um, I don't know what, exactly what happened, why why they changed, but uh, I think Dave Stewart, Tom got to know Dave Stewart of the Eurythmics, and they became friends. And I think Dave was was also a co-producer on those albums as well. Now, how long did you stay with MCA? Well, um, or I'm sorry, ABC after MCA, uh, Backstreet, you know, then <laughs> well, MCA. Backstreet, I stayed. <laughs> I stayed. Well, when 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 uh, Damn the Torpedoes came out, 
FM stations were playing five and six songs off this album. Yeah. It was so good. Don't Do Me Like That was the big hit. You know. Yeah. And, and, um, and Refugee. Right. And um, at that point when I think Damn the Torpedoes went to number two and stayed there for a long time, and the only reason they couldn't break through is because Pink Floyd had the, the oh, album yeah. off the wall. Right. But... Um, there had been a record, uh, independent promotion company that had been watching what I was doing, and they offered me a job, paying me a lot more money than I was making at Backstreet. And even though I didn't want to leave Tom, he knew we were solid friends, and he, anything that he encouraged me actually to take this job. And because he knew that we, I would be there for him at any point, any time. And. Um, <clears throat> At some point, Backstreet went kind of segued into MCA. I don't know exactly how or when, but mm-hmm. um, so I took the job as a as an independent promotion man for a company here in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. and I did that for five years. And um, I, I really only worked records that I liked. And MCA, I was fortunate enough that MCA, well, Tom and them kind of said, "Hey, look, you're hiring this guy as a promotion man to to be a consultant." And so I actually I stayed with Tom the whole time. As it turns out. Did you stay with Tom even after he, he left MCA to go to Warner Brothers? Um, yeah, I did. You know, and it, I was still I was still an independent promotion guy. I had my own company, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I, I was still with Tom. So ninety four Wildflowers. That was the first Warner release. I believe, uh, I believe so. Well, the Traveling Wilburys, I think, were on. Well, yeah, you're right. You're right. That counts as Warner. And wasn't it George Harrison who got Tom Petty the the um, signing at Warner that helped him? Yes, they oh, got yeah. him uh, yeah, with absolutely. Mo Austin. Absolutely, that's true. Okay. And um, yeah, the Wilburys were they were fantastic. Oh yeah, you know, I mean that to me, handle with care to me. That was like the best song of that year. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh no, totally. And um, unfortunately, you know, Roy Orbison died, yeah. and um, they, they felt like they couldn't continue because he, they felt he was one of the greatest singers in the world, and right. nobody could replace him. Right, right. So Traveling Wilburys did two albums, and that was it, I believe. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, there uh, was a volume one and volume three. <laughs> correct. I never knew why there was no two. I think they did yeah. that just to mess with people's heads. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, uh, I mean, but the, then there was, you know, let me tell you a Tom Petty story. I, I saw the band five times, and for me, that's a lot of times to see a band. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> and Sacramento is where I grew up, and also the Bay Area, I went to a lot of shows. So um, I actually came down to L.A. in the early 90s to visit a, a music biz friend who got me into the Troubadour one night to see uh, Roger McGuinn. Mm-hmm. And uh, out of nowhere, uh, Roger brings Tom Petty on stage. <laughs> Correct. And it was like, wow. And they did uh, probably My Back Pages mm-hmm. and, and some bird songs. And uh, in the crowd, I was hanging next to Weird Al Yankovic. <laughs> so, I mean, the Troubadour, that's a place where you could just go and see anything can happen, right? Sure, anything. Just kind of, I kind of like the whiskey in a, in a way. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that is a... <clears throat> That was a funny, funny time. But, you know, when Roger first heard American Girl, the rumor has it or the word, the story was that he asked somebody, did I write that song? <laughs> and because you know, it had a time of the birds were a tremendous influence on Tom. Yeah, I and could tell. So, yeah, but so. Yet he, he, he in, in the documentary, he said that he didn't really think they could sound like the birds. <laughs> The, the, right, the band couldn't sound like that. Tom no, Petty and the Heartbreakers. No, no, no. they were just influenced by their. But yeah. they, but you know, they made it their own sound. Tom and them. They, 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 yes, they were influenced by a lot of '60s bands and a lot of English bands, and but they made it their own sound. Oh yeah, definitely. And that's what's great about Tom. And you know, you go to see a Tom Petty show, and you're going to be, you know, for two and a half hours, you're going to be singing every song. And forgetting about anything that's happening in the world. Oh, yeah. He, he made it a party. He turned it into an event. He, he was one sure. of the best uh, performing acts I've ever seen. Uh, to me, he's one of the best garage bands in the world. And yeah, I definitely. say that with the utmost respect. Yep. 
um, because he he did cover songs and you know a lot of cover different cover songs. Yeah, and, psychotic reaction by the Count Five. Yeah, He's really Gloria, good at that. Um, um, did oh oh you know what um, when he got together uh, with Jeff Lynne and uh, Prince and uh, just a bunch of people and did while my guitar gently weeps correct that was awesome <laughs> yeah, it was absolutely awesome that was one of the greatest performances I've ever. seen ever. Yeah. yeah yeah pretty much so I mean that they were all at the top of their game so talk about your relationship with Tom like how well did you know him and uh, did you guys talk music and radio a lot oh, yeah I mean. We, I would bring a stack of new records over to his house, <clears throat> and we would just sit and listen to new records. And um, then he would play me some uh, some stuff that he had that were older records that influenced him. But I mainly would come over with new re- new releases that I liked. And one of them was uh, Tommy Two Tone eight six seven five three zero nine. Yeah. And he put them on the, their tour. Yeah. He was is the you know the opening band. And then I played him um, Pretty Little Thing, Let Me Light Your Candle, because Mama, I'm sure, hard to handle. That was Black Crow. Was it Black Crow? Yeah, Black Crow. Uh, or... Covering Otis Redding. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he heard that song, and he put them on on the tour. But, yeah, we used to listen to a lot of music and just sit around and talk and smoke and <laughs> and just... Party. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it really wasn't... Yeah, it, was a, it wasn't a drinking party or a mm. drug party. It was just... You know, having fun listening to new music. Yeah. That's well, he, we, we know how much Tom loved pot. Like some of the songs, um, you know, uh, um, this is how it feels. Uh, you, you don't know how it feels. That talks about rolling another joint. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is Mary Jane's Last Dance about pot? <laughs> no, I don't think it was. I think it was um character he made up. Um, I mean, everybody can construe that, of course, but I think it was about a character in Indiana <clears throat> that uh, was named Mary Jane. I mean, maybe he thought, well, this could be pretty funny and to call her Mary Jane. Yeah, double People will think that, but right. it's really just a character he made up, uh, a girl that he made up, a name that he made up. Okay. But, um, and that was the last record that MCA ever released. That was on the Greatest Hits album in uh, 1993. Yeah, that was a song that uh, I think he owed him one song, and and um, that's the song he recorded to put on there, <coughs> and uh, turned out to be a you know gigantic hit for him. Yeah, and then then of course uh, Wild. Flowers came out, and that was huge for huge. for Warner. And then after that, the, his career waned in terms of record sales. But at the same time, the record industry kind of uh, fell apart because of Napster in '99. So mm-hmm. sales fell apart for everybody. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, that, that happened. And but the MCA was didn't embrace that. MCA was definitely the the time period when he had the most success. Yeah, I would probably say so, especially with, you know, Damn the Torpedoes, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Southern Accents. Southern Accents and... Um, so you guys were hanging together all the time? Like, uh, all the time. So how about radio? Did he talk about radio much? Did he care, oh, yeah. care he about Oh, yeah, he loved it? talking about radio stations. I really, um, I got him involved with, um, well, on the road. I really kind of taught him how to go to do an interview because I was a DJ, and like, we talked about it. And I kind of, I kind of mentored him on how to what to do in a radio station. And uh, sometimes he wouldn't listen, but um, yeah, he was fascinated by radio, especially as a kid like me. I was fascinated by radio, and um, um, we um, we actually during the Wilbury uh, career, <clears throat> both of Tom, both Tom and I had fax machines, and we really didn't know anybody else who had them. So we started faxing each other. And he was, the faxes are in the book. They're funny, funny, funny faxes. But um, I had him fax every radio station in America, FM station, Mm -hmm. and just say, you know, Traveling Wilbury, salute WBC in Boston. And then radio stations would call me and, and go, is that really Tom Petty faxing us? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, can we fax him back? His number's on the fax. And I said, sure, he'd love it. <laughs> so he he was all into, he wanted to, he would fax me and want to know what <clears throat> what happened in the trades this week. And 
That was like what, the social media back then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I would send him over um, all the trade magazines, and he really got into the to being friends with people at uh, the trade magazines. You know what? And um, yeah, he he became a really. I mean, I think he was probably the only Wilbury who did this, but he really wanted to know why didn't they release this song? Why didn't they release? Handle with care. Or why are they giving up on handle with care? And um, yeah, that, that missed the top forty, but it's a, a big, big, big song in history. <laughs> correct. Oh yeah. And so um, yeah, he 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 loved hanging with the record guy. I mean, the radio station guys. Well, you know, speaking of radio, and by the way, this is producer Sam. Just want to jump in real quick. And uh, have you guys talked about his? Uh, time on Sirius XM doing his deep cut show because that was the best show on Sirius XM. Tom Petty's yeah, talk about Tom Petty's show on Sirius XM. Deep cut show, the best show, period. Buried Treasure, yeah, that was his well, well, deep cuts, or uh, yeah, Buried Treasure, what was, he, what was it called? Buried Treasure. Okay, cool. And it was all songs about Tom's, really, that he liked from his past, or artists that influenced him. And the great thing about Buried Treasure is he would just he was funny. He would say anything in the world. It was just kind of off, off the cuff, and you, you had to laugh at what he said because it was funny. And that's just the way he was. He was a super funny guy um, when you got to know him. And then when he got his own station, he just it became um, it became Tom Petty. He became the last DJ. <laughs> he became the last DJ pretty pretty much. Let's um, let's talk about that. I know that was on Warner, but when he came out with the last DJ and and also the album, the song with the with with the song Joe about the mm-hmm. CEO. Mm-hmm. What did the music industry think of that those songs, which portrayed you know the music mm-hmm. industry and radio industry as is not really being on the side of the people? Well, I think they they portrayed it as more as radio not being on the side of, of people. Because um, like with the last DJ, radio stations were tightening their playlists, probably because of the consultants still there, right? And they were really tightening their playlists. And it was hard to get a record played on the radio at, at, at one point, you know, during this period. And um, <clears throat> and Tom just felt like radio. It just you know, and, and a lot of record companies hated the fact that they had to go through a consultant to get a record player, right? And so I, I don't think I, I think it was more the the um, I don't think anybody really was angry about the last DJ because it was true. Yeah, it was coming, true it was story coming, all the way. <laughs> nobody was playing. You know, there was only a few stations in America that could play what they wanted to play. No more FM one hundreds. No, 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 <laughs> no. And or K Sands or. Or KMET. Well, there, there was still a few of those. KMET. They always. Uh, they 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 never. They never let a consultant. They never hired a consultant that I right, know of. Right. Tom, and Tom Jim Donahue Lattin, of course, ended up worked for KMT, and he is said to be the influence of the last DJ. Okay, Jim Ladd. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting. So you, I mean, you hung with Tom till the end, right? I mean, the 40th anniversary tour, uh, 2017. He even mentioned you in his final show. In um, in Hollywood, mm-hmm. wasn't that at the Hollywood Bowl? It was at the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah, I t- did three shows at the Hollywood Bowl, and I only went to the last show because I knew that it could be his last concert ever because there was word that he might stop touring, <coughs> even though there was a you know they were talking about doing a Wildflowers tour, but still there was also you know kind of the last gonna be the last tour, and and so Siri actually Sirius XM was had a um, live broadcast from the Hollywood Bowl that night. <clears throat> and I went down, and they asked me to just come and do an interview, and I think I did an interview about 6 o'clock at night. And I found this out later. One of the reasons, well, Tom stopped the show and dedicated a song to me called I Won't Back Down for what I did throughout his career. It was just stunning. I mean, just it was like in a trance. I I was in a different state of mind. I, I, I was tears coming out of my eyes of joy, but... So you didn't expect that? No, no, not at all. I mean, he, he he's given me shout-outs before in the past, but 
not like this one in front of 18,000 people, especially at his last concert ever. And I didn't go backstage that night. I did, I did the interview, and later on um, at the memorial for Tom, his wife told me, she said, do you want to know one of the reasons why he did that shout-out to you? And I said, sure. He said, well, we, they, she said, well, we got in the car about 6 o'clock to go to the Hollywood Bowl, and, of course, this station was on Tom Petty Radio. And he heard that I was getting ready to be interviewed, and he said, hey, be quiet. I want to hear what he, John Scott has to say. And so I told the story, basically, you know, as I, as I know it to be true. And um, he just looked at her and he said, Dana, he just, he, he just, that, what he just said hit my heart. And it hit my heart really hard. And um, so he, he, that's why one of the reasons he wanted to give me the shout out because he knew I was at, I was at the concert. And like I said, I think it was a gift he gave me. Where were you? Later, where were uh, you at the time when he m- made the announcement? Where? Yeah, where were you? Were oh, you I backstage? In, out, out in the, uh, I didn't go backstage, like I said, because I knew it would be bedlam back there. And so I was, I was sitting out in the audience and with my daughter. Oh, okay. And just not expecting anything like that. So it's captured on video. I've seen it on YouTube. Yes, it's pretty amazing. Because you have to understand, I had no idea it was coming. And when he did it, it I didn't know what to do. I, I, I couldn't believe it. But he, he did play I Won't Back Down because that's what I did in the beginning of his career. I just didn't back down. And that's what he said in the announcement, that you, you basically saved the band's career. That, that basically you just kept on going with it for six weeks and got it on the radio. Exactly. That's exactly what happened. And a lot of people ask. What would have happened to Tom Petty if you hadn't have come into his life? And there's no answer. Um, I mean, maybe he would have been signed by another band. That's surely as po- I mean, by another label. That's surely as possible. He could have broken up the band. And, uh, there's no telling. But um, so you but, wrote a book about it, Tom <laughs> Tom Petty and Me, and that's yeah. out right now. So tell us about the book and uh, sure. you know, uh, basically you've. You documented uh, your your relationship with Tom pretty much, right? Yeah, I did. Um, I was I had been working on a book about my life with <clears throat> excuse me um, about my life with the bands like Leonard Skinner and the Who and stories about that and and I and I was writing you know Tom was in there too, but when he passed away a week later, um, I, I sat down and I I couldn't write about. The Who, or Leonard Skinner, or Elton John, and um, to be perfectly honest with you, Tom visited me in a dream, and he's done that quite often. And a lot of people won't don't believe things like that, but I'm a firm believer in that. And um, he told me to call my book Tom Petty and Me, and I got up at four o'clock in the morning and went to GoDaddy. He typed in. Tom Petty and me dot com and there it was available. I just clicked on it and I said just sat down and started writing my story or stories about you near know, the very beginning, like we've talked about and how I became friends with him and you know, going on the road with him every night and watching history made every night because he wanted every concert to be better than the night before. And actually, he wanted every album to be better than the album before, and he pretty much did that. And that was a seeing him on a nightly basis <clears throat> was unbelievable because he he didn't have a complete you know he would change the set around a lot, <clears throat> um, so you never knew what was coming. And uh, I saw him do six encores one night. I just went, I've mm-hmm. never seen this thing like that in my life. But wow. so my book is basically all about stories about me and Tom. Um, and things that we did, and radio stations that we went to, and the fun we had at holidays. I, my wife, my family became their family, and um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's about hanging with Tom and his family at, at holidays. Um, in 1980, my house got flooded, and um, the insurance company deemed it an act of God; it wouldn't pay. So they we gave, they gave us army cots, and I think in two days he heard and said, "Hey, John, you're not sleeping on an army cot. You're coming to my house." Wow! And so we did for thirty days while we were rebuilding our house. 
and the same thing happened again. And I moved to Hawaii at one time, and uh, a hurricane hit in 1992 and knocked out power for eight weeks. And he heard in the first three days that we were going to be without power um, for eight weeks, and he sent me a generator via FedEx. Wow. <clears throat> and it's, he's, that's just the kind of guy he was. Yeah. You know, if you were, you know, if you were a friend of his or, you know, he, he liked you or even if he didn't like you, I mean, he, he did <laughs> things like that, you know, and it just showed that he, he never forgot. And like, just like Hollywood ball thing, he never forgot. Tom Petty and Me, the book written by John Scott. We're wrapping it up. Anything else you'd like to say, John? Sure. If you, uh, you know, it's available on Amazon and Amazon Kindle, but if you go to TomPettyandMe.com, <clears throat> I'll personalize every book. That, that there's a box in there where you, can, where you can put what you want me to say. Awesome. And then I sign every book. And um, I, I really think that's one of the reasons it's doing so well, because fans are opening it up and saying, this is to Donna. And... Um, uh, Tom Petty forever, whatever. And so that's, I've really enjoyed doing that that's, because hearing what people want, want me to say about Tom just blows my, blew my mind. And there's so many people, who, you know, they're just, they're, Tom Petty fans are like no other fans in the world. And, and there will never be another t- Tom Petty in the Heartbreakers in my life. I agree. Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, they mean a lot to a lot of us. And Tom Petty, one of the great social commentary rock and roll songwriters of all time. No kidding. John Scott, thank you for joining us today. Hey, thank you, Alex, so much. I really appreciate it. And it's been fun and uh, helped me relive the past. I'm actually going to see that. Today is actually Howie Epstein, the day he died. Um, wow. The bass player for Tom for so many mm-hmm. years. and. I'm going to see a tribute band tonight called Petty and the Heart Shakers. All right. And um, the guy that's the lead singer looks exactly like Tommy. could be his brother. <laughs> and the band is that good. I, I did it the uh, first time I saw him. I went to the dressing room. I did a double take. I looked at this guy and went, holy crap. <laughs> this guy looks like Tom Petty. And wow. he sings just like Tom Petty, too. But anyway... So, yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun talking to you. and uh, Definitely. We could talk again some other time about another Music Biz topic. It was great meeting you at the uh, Music Biz reunion about three year, three or four years ago in Calabasas. Yeah, we're going to do another one on May 13th. Oh, great, great, great. All right. Well, okay, thanks a lot. I'll... John, thanks for calling in, and we will talk with you again in the future. <laughs> On Social Music Talk, coming up next, The Wide World of Weed on WSRadio.com.